Thank you, Alexander, for the, for the kind introduction. Actually, I, I'm not sure whether I catched everything you said in Catalan, because the only thing I can say in Catalan is bon dia, and that's, that's about it. Uh, and uh, that's also about everything I can say in, in Spanish language. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased, actually, that uh, I got the opportunity to be invited here. Thank you very much. Um, we, um, uh, I, I, I met uh, Alexander and his wife uh, already a couple of years ago uh, when we were at a, um, uh, I, I guess actually at a different an conference, an equal soccer final conference, and um, uh, and I've been following um, Alexander's work. Since then, and uh, um, you know, it's we have we share a common common interest and in, in, in research interest, and uh, so I think it's I, I'm very glad actually to have the opportunity to see uh, and discuss with you um, some of the plans that you are doing now, and, and 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 see whether there are some whether there's some overlap in interest, and whether we can start some collaboration in the future. Um, I will be having a presentation on a, on a paper that I just recently finished. Uh, it's still very much a uh, work in progress. Um, it's a, a chapter for a, um, for a handbook on skills and training for the Oxford University Press. Um, and as I said, it's, it's, it's a draft version. You can, any comments on it would be well, more than welcome. Uh, but, but please don't quote it without permission because it's still under review at the moment, and so it's, it's not uh, public. Um, now, I, I actually I see that my title is um, might be a little bit mis misleading, uh, or it, at least it promises more than I can deliver. Um, because if I if I would have been here. 100 years ago and would have told you something about what would be expected from higher education graduates in the 20th century, I would never have predicted the things that happened in the past few decades. And uh, so I can never get near an answer to what will be expected in the 21st century as a whole. But, but um, my goal will be a little bit more modest and I will talk about developments in the coming decade and the kind of skills that, you know, the, the, the implications for skills that, uh, that will result from that. Um, actually, I will have two topics. By the way, if you, we are in a pretty informal setting anyway, if you have any questions or you like to raise something or you say, well, this is I don't agree or whatever, just please interrupt me or we can just um, uh, have this as, a, as an informal discussion. Um, and I will just continue talking unless you interrupt me, right? And, uh, um, so I will talk about two topics. One is uh, I will give you a sketch of the, the main developments in the, on the labor market for higher education graduates. And, and what this implies for the kind of skills that they need to have. Um, and secondly, I will also talk about you know what what are the implications for higher education? What what, what can they do to to help graduates, students to be better equipped for the labor market that they will face? Um, before that, I would like to give a brief sketch of 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 some of the main findings we did on a, uh, an international survey we conducted a couple of years ago. It's a reflex a survey, later followed up by the NGESCO. So it's, it's, a, it's a survey among graduates in some 20 European countries and in Japan. 
There's also an extension, by the way, by the, uh, made by a colleague of mine, Professor Mora, who is uh, who did an extension of this survey in Latin America. Um, and just to give a brief idea of you know how this world of work of graduates look, looks like, it's it's international, it's competitive, it's innovative, it's insecure, and it's professional. These are, I think, you know, gives a good description of you know what they what they face. Um, and actually, the the main message from the survey was that this holds for graduates from all the countries. There, the differences between, say, Spain and Norway are actually minor in terms of you know what what people face. It, there are major differences in labor market prospects, unemployment rates, but not in the kind of work that they get engaged in. Many students work in firms that have an international scope, it's strongly competitive, uh, not only in the private sector, but also in the, in the public sector. We face competition. We, as you know, working in academia, we know that there's competition in the public sector as well. We have to, to, to fight for uh, research funds or to, to get a, a publication in a good uh, journal or whatever. So that, we, we live in a competitive world as well. Um, many of the firms where graduates work are involved in the innovative activities. One thing that really surprised me, um, and I remind you, this survey was conducted in 2005. Uh, so well before the outbreak of the financial crisis, is that in the time that graduates, the, and, the, and the survey was conducted five years after graduation, and we asked graduates whether, you know, in the firm that they were employed in, whether they had experienced some major reorganization in the, in the firm. And 50% of the graduates already experienced a major reorganization in, in only, you know, the one to five years that they were employed, which I, I thought was a large number. It, it, it indicates that they're working in an insecure environment, even if they have a permanent contract. You know, they are working in, a, in an organization which is constantly um, uh, 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 reorganizing and things like that. And this has, of course, got worse in the, in the past few years, but uh, even in the good times, it uh, already was insecure. I will talk about six developments. Uh, and and um, I have to be honest, it's not that clear cut that you can say, well, these, there are only six developments. I could have said, well, there are five major developments. Some of them overlap a little bit. Um, uh, but we thought that for heuristic reasons, it would be best actually to to describe these these different these six developments, and um, uh, because they have different implications for the kind of skills that uh, that result from them. Um, and I will go into detail on each of these these developments and, and talk about it later and, uh, and and the related skills. So it's knowledge society, which has an implication for professional expertise, increasing uncertainty. Uh, ICT revolution, uh, the emergence of high performance workplaces, globalization, and change in the economic structure. These are the six developments that I want to talk about. And these are also the six related skill domains, you could say, well, that, that, are, uh, that have a relation with this. Um, in, the, in the past few decades, we've seen the, the, the transition from a industrial society to what has been called a post-industrial society. And, and the main characteristic of, of the post-industrial society is, I think, the primacy of theoretical knowledge. That is something which really also differentiates this kind of society, hence also the, 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 the term knowledge society, that has an impact on how uh, 
processes are organized, how uh, uh, businesses are organized, and the kind of workers that you need to have in, in, a, in an economy like that. Um, and um, that knowledge has become actually the most important factor to, to be competitive in the product market and on the, as, as a business but also to be competitive as a nation. And so the, 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 the stock of human capital you have, especially you know the, the number of higher educated professionals, really determines um, uh, the economic growth and the economic prospects of a, of a country. Um, and as we will see later on, um, all these developments, you know, are interconnected. It's not like, you know, uh, that uh, development like the emergence of a, of a modern society is something that stands apart from the other developments. It's facilitated by globalization. It's also facilitated by the ICT revolution. Um, and what we will see later is actually that ICT plays a major role, actually, in, in all of these developments. It's, it's the driving force of all the other developments that I will go into. Um, um, what it means, if you if you talk about a knowledge society, that it, there is a, a demand for knowledge workers. And what is a key characteristic of knowledge workers is that you know, they carry out tasks that are complex. That is a... a, a, a distinctive feature of, of knowledge works. They have tasks that are complex, that are non-routine, uh, non-repetitive, um, and in which they have to apply a collection of, of solutions to different kind of problems. Every time there is a new problem and they have to, to, to be able to choose the right solution for a specific problem at hand. Um, and so this also involves a lot of you know, what we call uh, unstructured decision making. It's not like you can have a handbook and see, okay, this is the problem, and if you have indication A and B, then uh, the answer is C. It's not like that. It's, it's more complicated. And that's why um, we'll get back to that uh, it, it, it also means that you know you cannot just replace knowledge workers with um, with computers. It, it, it is a um, uh, you need a specific um, uh, level of expert thinking. Um, we think that you know this development of, of knowledge society is particularly linked with the need for having professional experts. And we think there are three aspects of professional expertise that is, that is important. It's people need to have a specific body of knowledge, because you cannot um, uh, uh, find a solution for a problem if you don't have the specific knowledge actually to, to analyze and diagnose those, those, uh, those, those problems. You need to have a particular level of expert thinking is that you need to have a collection of solution methods that you are able to use and, and that you can apply in different situations. And you also need broad academic skills like reflectiveness, analytical thinking, interdisciplinary thing, skills. Because these professional experts are more and more working in an, in an environment which is interdisciplinary. I mean, you have you experience that yourself. You, in, in the university here, uh, you you have different schools and the students uh, meet each other. They work in an interdisciplinary environment. Um, Yeah. 
I, I think that is a good point. So the theoretical knowledge would more be something like um, the specific body of knowledge, right? That, I think we all think that gets more and more important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the distinction I made earlier, maybe, maybe we should restate that a little. It is that um, what 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 characterized the the knowledge society instead of say if you if you have an industrial society industrial then it's more practical knowledge that you need to have in order to uh, to make a car or make make things like and um, in the um, post-industrial society high level skills and I agree this might not only be theoretical knowledge, but also be, say, more broad academic skills, they, they characterize uh, the, the knowledge society. I think that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, psychologists have pointed out that it takes time to become an expert like this. Even if you graduate, you're, you're still a novice. Um, you start working and people if you, uh, there has been some nice research done in, uh, also in our university. See how students develop their level of expertise. And, you know, they, they, it starts from year one to year four, and they, then they graduate, and then actually the level of expertise drops because they, they are confronted with a new situation and they completely forget everything they learned. They, they start um, using their novice, their, their, um, uh, their, 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 their uh, uh, sort of, yeah. Um, they start to apply non-expert methods. And then they, after the, this practice shock, that it goes up again. And, and it takes some five to 10 years to really become an expert. Um, and experts <coughs> distinguish themselves from novices that they, they, they are able to immediately see uh, what is a problem. It, it's not something in, in if, if you have a, you, you obviously know, obviously know that. Um, if you have someone who just graduated, say as a, as a medical doctor, and he gets a patient, and he will look in the handbook and say, okay, I see this and this and then he must have the flu or he must have this and that. Right? And a medical doctor with experience might actually deviate from this solution because he says, well, it might be the case, but I think there is something else, but I, I don't know exactly what it is. But they, they actually intuitively know that they're that there is some other answer to this problem. And that makes him a good doctor, or, or a good doctor. And that takes, in every discipline, whether, whether you're an economist or an engineer or a medical doctor, it takes them five to 10 years to, to become such an expert. Um, second development is about increasing uncertainty. And, and you know, this is related to concept five, to the risk society, back, uh, the concept of transitional labor markets of Gunther Schmidt in particular, um, that means that, you know, the world has become more insecure, not only for people, also for businesses, uh, because, you know, markets are more uncertain, they are more volatile, um, and what organizations do is they pass on part of this uncertainty to the workforce. Well, we don't know how the product market will react, and you know, business can go up and down very, very quickly. So what they do is they rely on a, a core labor force that they will give good uh, employment contracts, and they will have a flexible uh, shell of labor which, which are offered non, non-standard employment contracts, like a flexible contract or. Freelancer or uh, 
so that they are more flexible in hiring, firing those, those flexible labor force. But also the core labor force is increasingly um, working in a flexible environment. They have to take up new jobs. It's not like you have a job for your lifetime. You, you have to change jobs, not only within a company, but also between companies. So it's, it's um, even for those who are supposedly in the core, and, and many of higher education graduates actually end up in the core, um, they're also confronted with, um, with insecurity. Um, so this calls for a need for, for flexibility, the, 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 the ability to be to stay employable for the rest of your life, and also to, to be responsible for, for lifelong learning, because you know that, that the skills that you learn during higher education are not, are not enough, actually, to, to help you through the rest of your, of your life. Um, what this implies for in, in terms of skills is that people need to be able to, to deal with this uncertainty and to cope with changes. Um, maybe this is not just a skill, uh, uh, it's also an attitude. Uh, by the way, if I talk about skills, I, I actually use the Anglo-Saxon word skill, which means competences, knowledge, skills, attitudes, everything, right? It's a, uh, so it's a broad concept of skills that I, I use. Um, they need to be able to deal with that. That's, that's definitely a sort of attitude that, that you're, you're actually able to, 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 to do that. Uh, you also need to be able to rapidly acquire new knowledge and skills. Because you don't have a job for your lifetime, you need to be able to change. Uh, there are changes in the environment, even if you, if you stay in your job. We know that in, in, in research, for example, you have fast developments that um, that uh, make you, um, you 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 need to stay ahead and, and, and to stay to, to keep pace with these developments actually to 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 stay in your line of business. Um, it also means that you need to take uh, responsibility for your own employability, okay, right? So what we see is that a lot of this responsibility for a career has been passed on from the organization to individual employees. And employees say, well, you are responsible for your own career. Uh, you have to be proactive and you have to be uh, 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 able to retrain yourself if, if, you, if your skills are obsolete or whatever. So that means that People need to have a very active attitude actually, towards these kind of changes. Also, maybe sometimes seeing changes as a, as a, as a wind of opportunity, um, but it needs at least be proactive and not wait until things happen. Uh, yeah. By the way, what we see in 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 the um, in the research that we did is that. If we look at, are, is flexibility in itself rewarded in, in terms of, you know, do more flexible people get more money? No. <laughs> uh, actually, they're not more often employed, they're not more often, uh, they do not get higher wages, they do not have a better career. Um, but it's more like, you know, flexibility, I see it as a sort of insurance policy. You know, you, you need to be flexible in case things change. But if it doesn't change, it doesn't get you any further. So it, it is something you need to have, but but more or less in case something happens. Uh, it's uh, Therefore, you know, you don't get a, a reward. Employers do not pay employees because they are flexible, but you need to be flexible in order something in, in case of a reorganization or whatever in order to, to be able to pick up these uh, challenges. Um, as I said, the, this development, the ICT revolution, is actually the most important one in, in terms of um, that it also affected all the other developments. 
you, you cannot think of, you know, um, the ICT revolution made globalization really globalization. I mean, it, it, it is the, at the back of um, the emergence of high performance workplaces, knowledge society, etc. So, therefore, I think this is probably the most important development that we have seen. And um, the important point is that um, this technological change is also what, what economists call uh, skill bias. It's, uh, it favors people who are highly skilled and profit from this kind of, 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 of change. Uh, and and it, um, uh, it is a threat for people with low and especially medium skills uh, labor. But we'll come back to that later. Just let me take one opportunity that, that if you think of, you know, what is the, um, uh, the, 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 um, The innovation capacity of organizations, if you, if you, if you think, you know, if, if you want to succeed in business and you, you, you want to prosper, you need to stay uh, active in innovation. And that is very much dependent on, you know, whether all the people in your organization actually can share this kind of, 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 uh, in, uh, of, of, of knowledge. I think we, we saw a very good example actually in the incubator, right? Where you have these these open spaces and, and and open windows, and the people work work together. Um, that is where I think you know innovation takes place because people are sharing information, um, even if they are coming from say different angles. And, uh, uh, the lady who who, who invents uh, perfume may learn something from her neighbor next, next door, right? And, and I think that is, that is really a key factor that, 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 that is behind the success of, of innovation. Um, as I said, the, 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 the ICT revolution, unlike you know, the mechanization that we saw before, mechanization really displaced lower skill. Know, lower skilled work was was mechanized and, or was outsourced to low wage countries. Um, ICT actually has an impact on medium skilled labor. As we can see in the following picture, it's what you see here is it, for a number of countries. I I'm, I'm not sure whether you can really read it, but it, it, the the idea is that um, here we have the different countries, USA and a number of uh, European countries. And this is the, the change in employment shares between 93 and 2006. Um, in terms of you know the lower third, the middle third, or the upper third uh, uh, part in terms of skills. But what you can see is that in every country, the middle part, the middle third, actually decreased over time. And you see it, this is a consistent pattern in all the countries. Um, which and the well the, the the lower third actually you know some countries it increase and some countries it stay more or less constant and there's an increase in, in the employment share uh, for the, um, uh, the, the the highest skilled people and this is an effect of, of ICT what what ICT did was not replace routine tasks, but replace um, tasks that can be programmed, that, that, that used to be medium skill, used to be carried out by medium skill laborers, like, you know, uh, secretariat, uh, people who are in, in middle level uh, engineering jobs, or they, that kind of work got actually replaced by by ICT, and ICT 
actually complements the, the the work of high skilled people. They, they, it is an ad. If we do research, you still need a researcher to uh, develop a questionnaire or to develop a business plan, etc. And we have computers actually to to become more productive because we can analyze much faster, etc. But the work of high skilled people has not been replaced by a computer. Uh, it is the work of medium skilled laborers that, that has been replaced. Um, now, the the ICT revolution did not only, you know, is not only important because it, it, it had an impact on all the other developments, but it's also important because it, it not it just not only has an effect on ICT-related skills, it affects all the other skills as well. You can think of no skill that we have now that has not been affected by, by ICT. If we do research now, we need to have a different body of knowledge than 20 or 30 years ago because of ICT. Um, even basic skills like reading, writing, numeracy is different if you do it in an electronic environment. Um, I'm, I'm one of the coordinators of the, of the PIAC project. PIAC is a, is a large, you, you, you know PISA, right? Uh, but PIAC is PISA for adults, for 16 to 65 years old. And it also conducted by the OECD. Uh, it's one of the adult literacy surveys. Um, what we, we used to test literacy and numeracy in a paper and pencil environment. Now we do it in an electronic environment. And that demands different kind of skills. People need to search, it, it's still, you know, you get a text, you need to deduct information and search for information in the text and, and see you know whether you can come up with the right answers but it's different if it's in an electronic environment it's not just a text on screen you have different um, you know on the internet you have different pages you have to find your way in this information it's a different it, 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 it changes even basic skills like you know uh, problem solving or um, but even if we only look at ICT skills, um, I think you know that it is important to keep in mind that ICT skills is more than just the keyboard skills that, or being able to 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 use a computer and to use certain software. That is what we would call medium related. ICT skills, it's the operational skills, it's, you know, uh, using software, using a mouse, using your keyboard, etc. Um, but there are also in information skills involved. Um, through ICT, for the first time, actually, you have not just a wealth, but you have an enormous, you have all the information available, whatever it what there is. I mean, there, there's, there's no limit. And so it becomes more important to, to be able to, to search for the right kind of information, to, to, to select the right kind of information, to, to weight it and to say, OK, this is reliable information from a trustworthy source. This I don't trust. How do you know that? I mean, this is the kind of of, of skill that you need to learn if, if you and ICT has has made that more important we we knew what was trustworthy um, uh, 30 years ago when we said okay when it's in the library and if it's in a scientific library it's probably scientific and it's okay but in the internet it's you have much more information which you need to to weigh and select and, and um, uh, so that is different. It also needs what we call strategic ICT skills. It's, it's, it's not just that you use information uh, or that you, you, you process information, get information, but you need to use it. 
for a specific purpose, for some goal. You need to, to, to be able to, to use it to achieve the goals of the organization or your, or your own personal goals. Um, so if we talk about innovation knowledge management, which is, I think, the key skill related to ICT uh, uh, revolution, we do not think of just you know the, the typical kind of you know innovator where you have someone in a lab, a nerd, uh, thinking about uh, you know inventing something weird or or, or something like that. Um, innovation knowledge management also implies that you need to be able to to take that from the drawing board into the organization and, and implement an, an innovation. You know. In innovation without an implementation is nothing. It's like, you know, writing a perfect paper but not publishing it or not presenting it to an audience. I mean, you can be ingenious, but if nobody knows it, it's, it doesn't work. And it's the same for innovation. If you again have a, 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 a major innovation, if it doesn't get implemented, if, if, if you also need the skills to implement it in an organization. Um, which means that there's more to it than just being creative and innovative. You also need to have kind of personal skills and organizational skills to, to make that work. And that is closely related actually to the next development and also uh, the next kind of skill. Yes. The, the fourth development that I wanted to talk about is, is the emergence of what has been labeled as high performance workplaces. Um, it's a bit of a bust but um, it's, it, it came into, into a fact that you know if you have a very fast, if you have a very volatile market and, and you know products are changing, you have a very fast product renewal, then organizations that are bureaucratic and um, you know, uh, not flexible to react in an adequate way to you know, changes in the product market, those kind of, of, of organizations will not succeed in the end. They will not be successful. The kind of organizations that are successful in the, in a market like that, which is characterized by, you know, fast developments, uh, uncertainty, but also, you know, fast uh, renewal of things, these are organizations that have been labeled as high-performance workplaces. They're characterized by having less hierarchical levels in the organization, uh, more autonomous teams, and more delegation of responsibility to lower levels. It's clear. I mean, if you if you need to have if you have a very uh, top-down decision making where you know every layer has to paragraph every decision, and um, then it may take actually months or years before you come up with a new product, and then actually the market has changed already. That, that that's not what you want. You want an organization which is flexible enough to to immediately change and see opportunities in the market. But that has a problem, because you can only do that if you delegate responsibilities to a lower level. Right? You, you need to trust your employees to actually to, to take up that, that responsibility. That also has implications for, for, um, for skills. Uh, we call that the the mobilization of human resources. It's actually the ability to make optimal use of your own skills as well as the skills of, of, of others. Um, and it involves interpersonal skills like your know, team working skills, the ability to communicate with each other, uh, etc. Self-management and organizational skills, uh, but also strategic skills. I think that is a very important if you um, if 
you delegate responsibility to a lower level, then you want to make sure that those people act in the interest of the organization. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a crash. It's not, no, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not a kindergarten, right? It's not about self-development. It's we, uh, in an organization, you have specific goals. And you want to make sure that you know these goals are achieved. And so this is not about self-development. It's, it's about you want to make sure that everybody in the organization knows how they fit in the wider picture and how they can actually contribute to achieving the organization's goals. Even if the organization doesn't know exactly how the market will work, but that they will act in that interest, actually. So um, that's why you need also some strategic organizational skills that you're able to see, you know, what your role is in the in the world picture. Um, then now, as it was already predicted by McClue in 1962. Um, that actually came ahead of, of, of uh, I, I think, the real globalization really took place as a, as a result of, of the ICT revolution. That, that really introduced the enormous uh, fast flow of information, of products, of services all over the world. We can have um, you know, a real unit, production unit, where people are working, say, in China and in South America, etc., working at the same time on a product. Um, and that is only made possible thanks to ICT revolution. That is, that is the driver of globalization. Um, and as I already said, I mean, already some 40% of graduates work in an organization that has some international scope. So it is really important, and this will continue to, uh, to, to be important. Um, and it implies that people need to have an international orientation, not only a, uh, a good foreign language proficiency, because that's what you need if you want to communicate with other cultures, but also intercultural skills. You need to be able to understand things. So even if you, um, even if even if it's just only, it's, it's not not different habits. It's also you know what is the intended meaning of of a, of a concept. Um, I got invited here, and. Um, I know that um, invitar in Spanish is is something completely different from to invite in in the UK. Um, in in the UK, you, know, you get invited. They ask you to come to give a presentation, and actually you are expected to pay your for your costs. And that is totally different in in, in Spain and. Invitar means you get invited, they take care of all the costs, and you're you're treated like you know the guest of honor. And 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 and, and, and I'm happy actually to to get an invitar instead of an invitation. <laughs> but I mean this is this is just a simple example. Um, but this is and if if you would translate it, it's probably it would be the same word, right? If it's a uh, uh, but it's a, it is a total different connotation. And you would probably be consulted if, if the other way around, if, if I would invite you and, 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 and not pay for your expenses, all right? It, 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 is, it is just not, it's not, not polite. Um, but it's a, it's a cultural difference. Um, we had a funny thing about that in the, in, the, in the translation of the questionnaires for this international survey of PIAC, where we, we asked the question about loyalty. Um, and um, um, I don't remember exactly what the, what the 
because it was something about you know how important this boy is, and um, and and um, I don't know how it was translated in 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 Spanish, but uh, we know that in the in the, in the pretest uh, there was a um, a considerable lower or no no there was a completely different response pattern in Spain. And that was because the, the Spanish translation of loyalty actually had a connotation with sexual loyalty to your partner. Which, of course, is something different than from you know being loyal to your friends or loyalty to with your employer, etc. Right? Um, but this is, I mean, so it's, 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 these kind of things can really have an impact. And, uh, and you need to be aware of this kind of um, Oh, the differences as well. Uh, and it become more important, also more funny actually, <laughs> if you work in an international environment. But uh, it's, uh, it's it's something to be aware of. Um, the last development um, I'll talk about is the change in the economic structure. Um, we already said well, there is a decline of the traditional manufacturing study uh, uh, and the growth of the service sector. What we have also seen is that there is a, a tremendous growth in, in SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. And actually here also, ICT played a major role in making this happen because thanks to ICT, you can actually have your own business without an establishment. You, you just need a computer, right? And you can start your own business and you don't need anything else. And you can have, uh, a, a, a perfect, well, uh, well-doing business actually, uh, just as a very small, uh, as a very small uh, company, um, and specifically those those SMEs play a major role in innovation, as we know, it's, it's like what you do here with your incubators. You have small small groups of people working together and they, they innovate, they create jobs, they, they, they are the motor of, of, of economic growth. Um, and that is related to, to entrepreneurship. It's, it's something different from being innovative, I would say. If being innovative is really about, you know, you need to be creative side and, and, and taking it into the implementation. But entrepreneurship also adds the aspect of, you know, you need to understand the commercial value of something. I mean, you can have a good innovation, but if it's, it, if it doesn't work as a commercial product, it's, it's nothing. I mean, so it's, it's entrepreneurship really uh, stresses um, this commercial aspect of an idea and, and, and the ability to, to pursue the opportunities to actually make this, make this happen. I think you, you probably know more about entrepreneurship uh, than I do. So actually, uh, not to say too much about it. But what we do know is that it is usually regarded as a weak point of higher education. You don't learn entrepreneurial skills at a university here, maybe, but not in normal traditional universities. You don't learn that. Right? Um, Here I will start with the second uh, topic, and we can have, um, if you want, I can continue. We can also have a short break, or we can have questions, or whatever you want. Yeah? Uh, I think you mentioned that you have a certification for entrepreneurship. Yeah. Is that okay? It's not, it's not too boring. You can, yeah? Okay. No, 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 no. no. Um, um, what we did in the second part of the paper was, is actually to, to think of, you know, how can higher education deal with all this? And um, we're not, we're not out, we don't, we do not give a simple recipe. It's not like, you know, this is a book of recipes which you should do. Uh, because it's not as simple as that and actually we don't know. We don't know enough about this actually to, 
we know more about, I would say, the developments at the, at, at the kind of scale that, that are required, but we don't know enough yet about what, is, what this implies for higher education. Well, what we did instead is actually give some, draw up some general guidelines in terms of, you know, this is what you should think of. And one of the first is actually, do not make the mistake that if we talk about these kind of skills, like, you know, people need to be an expert, they need to be flexible, they need to be innovative, they need to be, uh, you know, uh, have interpersonal skills, they need to be entrepreneurs, etc. This is not something that needs to be united in one person. That, that's not, we don't need that. Those people don't exist. Um, and even if they would exist, we don't need them. We need a mix of graduates who have, as a whole, this kind of skills. You don't want only innovators, or only entrepreneurs, or only experts. You need some experts, you need some entrepreneurs, you need some people who are very good in team working, etc. And what then, if that's the trick, so there's also another argument of this, which I will come back later. I mean, it's if you specialize in, in a certain thing, you cannot, you know, be maybe an expert and a good entrepreneur at the same time. You need to specialize in something. Time is short. So either I give them a, a course on entrepreneurship or I give them an additional course and, you know, to make them a better expert. But I can do it both, right? So, but that also means that the expert will become a better expert and the entrepreneur will become a better entrepreneur if I, if I specialize. And that will increase productivity. But what it means is that we need to think about what is the minimum level that everybody needs in order to be able to work well with each other. And that probably relates to uh, a minimum level of, you know, people need to have good, broad academic skills. People need to have good interpersonal skills in order to be able to work with, with each other. And they need to have strategic organizational skills. And the kind of you know, ICT skills like you know, searching information, etc. That is basic for everybody. And then, aside from that, some people might specialize more as an entrepreneur, others more as an expert, as a, as a good, becoming a very good engineer, or whatever. Um, the second thing is that not everything, I mean, we want more be developed in higher education that we actually have time, right? And especially if you talk with policy makers, they, they even want more to do in, 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 in education. They, they want people to have good math skills and language skills, and, and we need to teach civic ed education and science and biology and all these things. But it's simply, there is a limitation of time, as every, every economist knows. So, if there is, even if we make students work 40 hours a week, which they don't, I mean, if, I don't know how this Spanish students, maybe they do, but, but in, in the Netherlands, they work maybe 25 hours or so. And even if they were, would work 40 hours, that's a limit. That's a limit. So you, you're faced with, with trade-offs. You need to ask which are the kind of skills and which are the courses that people really need to have in higher education and which things we can live with if they don't get it. That's, that's, that's something we need to ask. And what we, it helps if you ask yourself the following questions. Is higher education the best, the most efficient environment to develop these skills? So we know education is pretty good in, you know, uh, in, 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 in giving theoretical knowledge, right? But that's, that was their core business for decades, centuries. Are they good in developing interpersonal skills? I don't know. Maybe, 
maybe they're good, but maybe other environments like you know voluntary or associations or whatever is is is, is a more efficient environment. Sometimes, if we look at say leadership skills, um, maybe leadership skills are better developed when you're in your career in the working, and, and maybe not during the scarce time in, in higher education. I don't know, but we need to have an answer to this. Um, you need to ask yourself, what is the best age to develop the skills? Right? So um, we know that you know young children uh, learn very fast, and they can learn a lot in between 6 and 12, and, and, and can learn a lot of language skills, for example. Language is something which you best develop at a young age. Um, I tried a couple of years ago actually to 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 learn a little bit of Spanish when we wanted to, to for a holiday reason actually, and I I was a little bit disappointed <laughs> that it took so much time and effort to I I, I thought I better I better skip that right, <laughs> but it's I'm. I'm too old actually to, to learn a new language efficiently. I should have done it when I was 12 or 13. Um, what is the trade-off? If you develop one skill, does it mean that it is at the expense of, of another? This is not something policymakers usually do. They say you need to teach math and language and civics, and then there's also you know 10 or a dozen or 20 other things that you need to learn. But there's a time limitation. So tell me, what is the effect? If I do this, then I can't do that, right? Sometimes there's a trade-off. Sometimes you can do things together. For example, um, I can teach math, and I can teach, at the same time, people to work together if they do group work, right? Then I have can develop interpersonal skills without an effect on the development of math skills. Okay, if that's if there is no trade-off, you should do that. If I have to choose between developing the math skills and the, the teamwork skills, it is really a trade-off. I would say teach them math and not teamwork skills because the teamwork skills they can also learn while they're playing soccer, right? You don't need to have school for that. But it's you need to know whether there is a trade-off. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Um, sometimes a certain skill is not needed in itself, but it is a prerequisite for the development of other skills. Um, I, well, we could think of you know something like um, philosophy, philosophy of science. Um, for me personally, I would say well, maybe knowledge or philosophy doesn't have any direct labor market value of itself, but it helps you to develop your sharp and your analytical skills. It helps you to, 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 to become a better academic. If that is the case, it's very important actually that we teach that to our students. Right? Um, then there's a whole discussion about whether we should develop have specialists or generalists, in, and, and, and uh, many people have said, "Well, things are changing so fast. Um, we need to to have to to raise generalists, uh, and, and, and specialists are you know all this knowledge is becoming obsolete in a very fast way. And if you want to learn, if you want to uh, uh, know something specific, you can." Go to the internet, Google, and, and, and you'll find the latest information. That's, that's what some people think. That is a misconception. It's a misconception about how people learn. Because even those generic skills like analytical thinking, diagnostic abilities, you cannot learn these without content. You need content. You need to, you need to have a discipline of yourself interdisciplinary, some, some, some field of knowledge, and, option, uh, and actually to, to develop this kind of skills. Uh, you don't, 
um, they try to, to actually to develop courses like analytical thinking or learning to learn, but if it's empty, if, it isn't, if there's no content, you don't develop them. You develop them as a, 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 through the vehicle of a, of, a, of a specific body of knowledge. That's how you become, that's how you develop your, your, your generic skills. So, my, under, my understanding of this is that uh, usually knowledge and also professional specific knowledge is, is very much underestimated. Um, it is something you really need, also a body of knowledge, a theoretical knowledge to, to come back to that point. To become an expert, um, you do not just sit in your room, Google for say three months and you become an expert in, in accountancy. It doesn't work like that. You need, you need to be able to, to judge and to, 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 to build up this, this body of knowledge and then new knowledge will fit in. That is, that is how it works. And that's why we see that people who are really experts, they are also doing well when they are working outside their own domain. If you are a very good economist, you can use those skills to actually also apply it in a different uh, setting. Um, and that is because, because you were an expert, you also develop all these generic skills. But you cannot develop these generic skills without being um, you also have to strike a balance. Well, generally, we can say education has, has, a, has a lot of functions. You need to do skills, you need to do something about equality of opportunities, there's a, a function in terms of preparing for the labor market. And in preparation for the labor market, you have a short term and a long term goal. You, you want to give graduates an entry ticket to the labor market and say, okay, Give them the skills so that they can smoothly go into the labor market and, and find a way. Um, but you also want to prepare them for long-term employability. And this is not just like the generalist specialist thing. Even if you are a specialist, you can think of something which immediately, uh, giving them the skills which help them to immediately be productive in a job or more a, a, a sort of broad professional who is able to develop his career. I think edu higher education institutes need to strike a balance between these two goals. And um, there is a danger in specializing too much and too soon. So if you, if you um, even as, as an expert, if you have a too narrow focus in your, in your study program, that may help you in the first few years of your of your uh, career, but it may be, you know, disadvantages for the longer term career. Um, and from all we know, actually, is that um, these 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 programs who are very pragmatic and, 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 and you know very much oriented to its direct application of getting skills that are, can directly be applied in the labor market, they, they produce graduates, school leavers that smoothly go into the labor market, that's good, but their long-term career uh, is actually worse than for graduates who are raised in a system that has a broader uh, perspective. Um, another thing to to keep in mind, um, and that is that if we think of skills, we think of curriculum. We think, okay, well, we need to develop these skills, and so we have a module or a course or whatever on these kind of skills. But curriculum is only one of the drivers of skills. Just as important is the learning format and the, and the way we assess people. Uh, there are even colleagues of mine who claim that assessment is more important than curriculum. It's, it's a, they think of you know, a, a student as a very calculating person. 
they do not learn something because they come into your class or because they hear your presentation. They learn something because they have an exam. And, and once they start working for the exam, that's when they learn. Um, and, 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 and so the way you assess people should be in line with the kind of skills that you want to teach. So in the Netherlands, we, we very often, because of mass education, we very often employ multiple choice exams. It's terrible. If you, the only thing you learn there is to sharpen your short-term memory. And it's very good if you, if you play games, right? Uh, or play cards to have this great short-term memory capacity, but it doesn't make you an expert, right? Because they, once they have done the exam, they wipe their mental disk, forget everything they learned, and, and, and start learning for the new exam after a few weeks. Uh, so the way you assess and the way you, you organize uh, your, your, your learning, uh, like you know whether you have lectures or working groups or problem-based learning or you know different learning formats also mean that you learn different kind of things. Um, and then there is a need, um, almost at the end, uh, I think there is a need for higher education to become more international oriented. It has become more so in the past decade. We see that with all the exchange programs and all a lot of students going into the Erasmus program. But I would say the world has changed even faster. And, it, and that is a, 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 a something which is a minor, a weak point of higher education all over Europe. Um, it is not very international. The Anglo-Saxon countries have some advantage, of course, that they they speak a language which is which is international. And, uh, but it's 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 uh, it means that you need to have uh, need to be more aware of you know having these foreign language proficiency and intercultural skills. Also means I would say have more courses and, and, and materials in English. Uh, I understand that we here. In, in, in Catalan, you, you would actually not, you, know, you, would, you would have maybe uh, presentations or lectures in Catalan, right? Or, uh, but it is not as good as that may be, I mean, for, for other reasons. It may not be a good way to, to foster an international orientation of students. So, um, something to, to think of. Finally, I would say what is very important um, that also you know is, is something in line with some of the research interests of, of some of you here is that we ICT does not only affect the world of work but also education um, and there are huge huge developments in, in ICT. I'm, I'm not an expert at this, so, but I've, I've I've seen some examples of you know where. Uh, it changes possibilities for, for the content of education curriculum, um, the, the possibilities for, for staffing, uh, for assessment, the huge, huge possibilities that we could not have dreamed of. Could it? That you can now have access to the best teachers all over the world through the internet. I mean, why would we have a local professor? teaching something when we have another professor, say, 200 kilometers further, doing it much better. I mean, that's, that's how you can use ICT. Uh, there is a very fast development in, in assessing students, where you have automated scoring of texts and, and good diagnostic systems to, to see how how people progress in education. And that's all made possible through ICT. I think we should make more use of that. The problem is teachers. Because teachers are, in practice, I, I think universities are, are, are not that bad. And secondary education is probably worse. Uh, I don't know how it is in Spain. 
but in, in the Netherlands, uh, I would say half of, of the teachers um, doesn't know, well, they don't know what a computer is, they know how to work with it, but they, they don't use all the possibilities. Um, and that is because, you know, the students are more, you know, they, they know more about it, but they are medium oriented, they, they know the tools, but they lack content skills, they, they still lack the, the how you search for information, how you evaluate information on the internet, etc. Um, so finally, this is my last sheet. I think there are major challenges for education in general, uh, not only for higher education. And um, I think that is pretty much unprecedented. There's, there's much actually that is expected from, from, from education. Society expects a lot, policymakers expect a lot. Um, there's much pressure, and that is in a time where you know it's more insecure, there are fewer resources. Um, I think one of the uh, main challenges actually would be to make good and effective use of ICT and education to deal with all these challenges. Um, also, because um, Education also, higher education, uh, has to deal with more, you know, uh, more individual differences, larger groups of people coming into the university, but they also differ more in terms of skill profiles, interests, etc. So you need to be able to deal with that, and it's, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all education. In, so there is also a need for flexibility because uh, students, as customers, want, want more flexibility. There's also a need to, to make optimal use of resources, etc. So that also implies that you need to have more flexibility. Um, there's a need for lifelong learning. Universities do not play a role in lifelong learning. I mean, at least not in the Netherlands. Uh, they they play a role in initial education. But I think they should play a role in, in lifelong learning as well. Um, you need universities to open up for people who are 40 and want to be retrained, or want to have additional courses to, to refresh their, their skills. Um, I think it's also good to, uh, in, a, in a situation where you have decreasing resources, to, to see whether you can use ICT as a means actually to, to still deliver. Um, while having fewer results.